If I ask you to think back to an early childhood memory, what comes to mind? The ground smell when, when it rains. This memory is stuck in my mind and, and always when it rains, I just compare that smell to the smell of my homeland and I really miss those days. When I was uh, growing up, there was uh, some times that I had to sell peanuts. When as a child, we were at home and we were always constantly worried about the police and the threat of the police. The I remember when the airstrike hit my area. I remember we had a better life there. We used to have food and everything. Here, we have nothing. So I always look what happened to me, what I have done when I was young, what I have done to survive. Juliet, who you just heard there, was born a refugee, the same as about 300,000 other children every year. The voices before, people all forced to flee at a young age. Around 35 million children are displaced worldwide, either within their own country or across a border. Millions are unable to continue their education. But even those who can face obstacles along the way. So if we don't want to continue this cycle, we have to give the opportunity for children to study and to have educational life so they can really support themselves and build a better future. And that way, we, we don't lose a whole generation. This is Forced to Flee, a podcast from UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. I'm Anita Rani. Episode three, Pencils and Pictures. Education is an ingredient that any human being has an entitled to, and that's why it's a human right. Uh, my name is Emily Lugano. I'm the Senior Education Officer for UNHCR in the East Horn and Great Lakes region. Without education, it becomes very difficult to be able to, to engage in almost all areas of life. But with education, it just opens up opportunities. There are more than 7 million school-aged refugee children. Around half of them are not in class. And without a place to study, play and grow, they're left extremely vulnerable. We find that there are youth that are recruited into armed conflicts. We have fear of youth being radicalized fear of youth being exposed to early marriages, early pregnancies, things that keep them out of school, but also expose them a lot to risks. In this episode, we'll meet two refugees trying to mitigate those risks for others. We'll hear about their journeys, what it was like to flee at a young age, and in one case, make the journey completely on his own. Part one, defying gravity. I have small glimpse of it. And the glimpse that I have, most of them are bloody. Mary Maker's earliest memories are of war, of planes in the sky, of diving for safety, of being on the run. These terrifying planes that would drop these bombs and we had to either run to hide inside an underground dark trench and I remember my mother would open this door so that we all jump in the moment we had these planes coming from a distance. That was one of my most terrifying memory of my childhood. Mary was born in what is now South Sudan. She doesn't know the exact year, but believes it was around 1996. The Sudanese civil war forced her family to move from village to village and then across the border to Kenya. Along with her mother and sisters, she walked hundreds of kilometers to Kakuma refugee camp. What she remembers most about the day she arrived is the silence. And when we moved into the reception area of uh, UNHCR, I, I would tell my mom, I can't hear the boom. There was no gunshots or planes dropping off their terrifying bombs or even a community coming to raid and burn 
our houses down. We lived in tents at that moment, but there was a sense of peace. Mary admits she was still on edge, but she was also able to finally be a kid. She was drawn to games that involved singing and acting. It was just a fun time. It was, it was a fun moment because we were learning to connect with friends while when we were fleeing, there was no room for friends. There was no room to connect. There was now also room for another crucial part of every child's upbringing, school. Good morning. Good morning. The fun aspect again is coming in. I just love the whole experience of having other kids sing along to singing games. And my mother is literally just so proud at this moment because she knows the child is safe. My child is going to school. She's learning something new. And the idea of me helping her in the future was something that she had in her mind. So school was really fun. It was congested though. Kenya falls under the region covered by Emily Lugano. Schools in that part of Africa often have more than a thousand students, but only 10 to 12 classrooms. We also have limited number of teachers. We'll have overcrowded classrooms, having students that are quite compacted in one classroom, majority of them due to limited desks are sitting on the floor. Goodbye, teacher. We were just like all there, congested together, trying to write our names in this little piece of paper. Of course, there were, the resources were scarce, so one book would be torn apart into, I don't know, different parts, and then everyone gets a slice or like a piece of paper and a pencil that is probably broken into three, <laughs> so you have to sharpen that little part that you get, and you have to guard that with your life. Like, don't you dare take my pencil, you know? <laughs> It was a fun moment. I loved it. I want to fly. I want to fly. The lack of personal space or even a full pencil, as you heard, didn't deter Mary. But she didn't stay long in the camp. Her father, who was still in South Sudan, came to pick her up. At first, he took her to live with his other wife in Nakuru, a town three hours northwest of Nairobi. He then put her into boarding school. For Mary, the differences were stark. You can see organisms. We were only 20, 20 students in a class. I have my own book. I have my own pencils. The teachers are one-on-one, -on -one, you know, like there was a lot of resources and I knew I was, I was in a different space. In 2009, she was forced to leave the boarding school because of heartbreaking news from the camp. Mary's mother died. She went back to Kakuma, but didn't make it in time to attend her mother's funeral. And so as the eldest kid, you know, it is your duty to go and take care of your siblings. So I, I went back to the camp and it was devastating. I had to drop out at sixth grade to go take care of my siblings. And I never thought I'd go back to school because I couldn't even play the role of being a mother. I used to cry a lot with them. They cry, I cry too. Yet the community was like, how dare you cry? You're the first one. You don't have to grieve. Grief is not a part of you. It wasn't the only death her family was grieving. Her stepmother died around the same time. Her father was distraught. Mary tried to convince him to allow her siblings and step-siblings to move in together. Eventually, he agreed. Mary was able to go back to school, but just three years later, her family would grieve again. Her father died in South Sudan. She struggled to pay her school fees. Some of her father's friends sent money because they knew how important education was to him. He started having a mantra for us. Education is your first husband. Do not allow a man to take over your life. The moment you have your education, you get your own freedom. And he made so much sense. I never heard any man in my community tell that to their kids. And so I knew this was my prize. So when I got kicked out of school after his death, I just had to negotiate with the school and, um, and with the well wishes so they would pay sometime or not. And, you know, like at the beginning of the term, I don't know, it's some kind of shame. The principal would come in with the names of those that did not pay school fees. <laughs> like, Mary, get out of class, you know, you walk out. It's a shame because other kids are like, oh, 
probably she comes from a poor family. Oh, they can't afford these copies. And then, you know, you, you, your self-confidence is being crushed <laughs> and you walk out, but I would climb back through the windows and pretend as if they did not call me. They're like, Mary, did I not just call you? Oh, I was stubborn. Despite all of those struggles, Mary was able to finish high school. But all of it had an impact on her grades. You can imagine if you keep missing school, you're not going to perform well. I didn't perform well. Got like a C, C plus. And I cried. I, I was devastated because this is the system in Kenya. People do not look at your talent. People want you to get B's and A's in order to go to university. Mary was determined to try again. Along with a friend, she walked from school to school, pleading her case, asking someone, anyone, to believe in her. Since childhood, she was drawn to theatre, so she used that to make her pitch. So I was like, let me use my acting skills. You knock at every door, like, hello there. So my name is Mary. <laughs> I bring you, this is what I'm offering you. I'll offer you my confidence. I will offer you, like, I'll talk about anything through theatre. Just give me a scholarship. And, you know, most of people will be like, these kids are joking, you know, slam the door after you. They kept going until they found a principal who was willing to give them a chance. Mary was back in school. Her grades improved. But then another roadblock. She was left wondering why she even bothered in the first place. I try to apply for universities, but do you have loans or anything to pay for that? Do I even have any property to begin with? Nothing at all. And I was like, why did I go back to school? You know, you kind of question yourself. Because education is open to all students, both nationals and refugees, they face a very stiff competition. Only 5% of refugees globally are able to access higher education. The biggest challenge, again, is the cost. In some countries, they're asked to pay as international students, and this makes it very expensive for UNHCR to be able to support the refugees in higher education. With no prospect of getting into university, Mary decided to go back to Kakuma refugee camp. I used to cry a lot and just, like, get depressed about it. But I was like, I'm going to channel my energy into something else. So I started doing a lot of coaching with primary schools and I felt so much fulfilled by doing that. So after uh, I started working at Kakuma Secondary School, volunteering also, and I taught a lot of business biology and sometimes physics practical. And I found so much fulfillment. I know I was lying to myself because I knew there was a dead end. I was in it. But just that feeling of giving my knowledge to them made them see me like someone that had accomplished something. And just the hunger that I saw in their eyes of wanting to succeed so badly made me think like, okay, it didn't work out for me. It will work out for them. Just like the primary schools in the camp, the secondary school was packed. Often her class had more than 100 students and again with limited resources. Like their biology lab is, is literally in ruin. It's in shambles. You tell you like you're trying to do like some litmus test or like any kind of uh, changing acid to base. It doesn't turn pink or doesn't turn blue the way it should turn. It turns into some weird colors. And yet you're supposed to be graded with someone that went to Nairobi. That wasn't fair. Still isn't fair. But at the same time, they still come to school. Mary admits she wasn't a qualified teacher. That's the case for most educators in the camp. The majority are also refugees. So again, Mary turned to what she knew best, theatre. When I come up with a play, most of the time I randomly came up with a storyline, mostly me inserting myself in these storylines, but taking a name of somebody else. And in that way, it was a less obvious way of sending them a message, a message of hope, a message of resilience, a message of grit. That's what I wanted them to have, to be hopeful. Because in the camp, there is hope. I will not deny that there is hopelessness, but there is hope. And that is the hope that you need to nurture. I did not want to make a mistake of killing that little hope that was in them. And theater helped me accomplish that. Today is the 
It was while Mary was teaching, as she was trying to keep that hope alive in her students, that she had her own breakthrough. She heard of a program in Rwanda that could help her get to university, but it would take two years and there were conditions. If I pass my exam, my TOEFL and SAT, I get a scholarship in the US. If I don't, I go back to the camp. Two years. That is a long time to waste. So I gave it my all. And in 2019, MasterCard took me in, MasterCard Foundation, and they were like, they would pair me with, with one of their schools in the United States. And I was so excited. So when I got an acceptance letter to St. Olaf, I knew this was the beginning of my journey. I was so happy. I didn't know I was coming to Minnesota, which is really cold. <laughs> I present to you all Under the Bow of Tree, written by Moa. <laughs> Mary describes her play as a piece of imagination. Just stop it already. I'm no one's property. <laughs> you sound so serious. You know, that's the only way we get out of the homestead, right? It's based on her understanding of South Sudan and the struggles of living in a patriarchal society. It explores the forbidden love. I see the way you look at me. <laughs> me? Mm -hmm. Between two women from different ethnic backgrounds. She was able to stage this play at her school in April. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um... I am growing in this society where people want to invest in me, wants me to grow. Yet where I was coming from, there was no one who wants to do that. Mary is trying to change that. Even though she's now a student, she hasn't let go of being a teacher. Along with her friends, she started a program to invest in others so they can also grow. What we do is train students at the refugee camp on the opportunities that exist. So I teach a lot at night <laughs> or like at 4 a.m. because they have grades they can get into school just that there's nobody investing in them. Like we got our first cohort, 90 students applied, but we don't have resources for all of them. We only took 13. That makes my heart pain. <laughs> but I just feel like if we are able to get this 13 to school, that would be an accomplishment. And we can keep doing this to get as many refugees to schools. That's what I want all the refugees to feel like, supported, that there's somebody that could invest in them because they have so much talent. If Mary could go back and talk to her younger self as she was about to embark on this journey, she'd say... Education is your first husband. <laughs> the same thing my father told me. I'll go back and tell her to do the things that she loves and don't care about what other people think of her. I'd go and tell her not to shrink herself or keep quiet or be silenced by community. And by community, I mean patriarchy. <laughs> Rather, just go and defy gravity. Be herself, spread her wings and fly. I'll tell myself that. I'll tell myself to be hopeful and not kill the little hope that I had. To be extravaganza, or like to be extroverted, you know, exactly. Part two, a guarantee. On the outskirts of Bamako, Mali, Mohamed Keita is teaching a group of at-risk teenagers about photography. His students are from all over West Africa, but most are not in school. Mohamed can relate. He was once a teenager out of school trying to survive. I thought I was going to spend my whole life in my village with my parents. But this is my life, and I cannot fight my destiny. Mohammed was born in neighboring Ivory Coast. He grew up in a small village in the north with his parents and older brother. I would say everything I'm trying to do now with my life is thanks to what my parents taught me. Respect towards other people and to understand that things change. Life always changes. His life changed in an instant in 2006. Ivory Coast was in the middle of a civil war between government forces in the south and rebel forces in the north. 
my mom with my dad. I was with my mother and father in our house when we heard a huge bang in the distance. I ran outside to see where the noise was coming from and that's when the bomb hit our house. My mother and father lost their lives. Mohammed was only 13 years old. It was just me and my brother on our own. Shortly after the rebels captured our village, they didn't hurt us, but they forced people in the village to work for them. I was little, but my brother was 16 and was afraid if he didn't keep helping them, they would hurt him. So one day, without a word, he just left. I learned later he fled to Mali, but I didn't know where he went at the time. Mohammed went to live with an uncle in a nearby town, but he knew he couldn't stay there. It was dangerous there too, with constant shooting and bombing sounds in the distance. When we thought armed men were coming, the whole village would hide in the bush. But my uncle would take his son with him, but not me. I treated him like a father, but he didn't treat me like a son. Fearing for his safety, Mohammed was forced to leave the country. He joined a group of people and walked 50 kilometers to Guinea. In Guinea, I spent my days at the bus terminal, helping people with their luggage to earn some money. I got to know some traffickers who organized groups of people taking them to Mali, so I paid for a passage to Mali in a truck. It was a terrible, lonely time as I crossed Mali. It pained me to think I had nothing and no one in the world. From Mali, Mohammed traveled to Algeria and then Libya. He didn't have much money and was forced to stop several times along the way to earn more. He would pick crops, haul rocks, or take any other job he could find. He was 15 years old when he entered Libya. The trip to Libya across the desert was very hard. We didn't follow a railroad because we had to avoid towns and villages. When the track broke down or when there was a steep hill, the driver would say, everyone out and push. I was so tired. It was terrible to hear those words. To keep the track light, there was very little water and we were given just one glass a day. You had to save some of it to cook your porridge. The traffickers were terrified the water might run out and we would all die. The journey to Libya was difficult. And once he was there, it didn't get any easier. The police, they are cruel. They arrested me because I didn't have the papers to be in Libya and they threw me in prison. I was there for five months in a cell with many other people. Sometimes they would bring you food, but some days the food ran out so you'd only get a small snack in the morning. One day, a few of us escaped during mealtime when the gates were left open. Mohammed worked odd jobs, but often he wasn't paid. Even when he was, he didn't have anywhere to keep his money. He couldn't open a bank account. Sometimes people would offer us work and take us to a certain place where they would rob us. There was nothing you could do. After more than a year and a half in Libya, Mohammed paid smugglers to help him cross the Mediterranean Sea. He was crammed into a small boat along with 30 adults and two children. The journey by boat is very risky, but you do it when you don't have other possibilities. When you meet someone who decides to go, is because there's something difficult that pushed him to do it because there's really no one who wants to risk their life in the water like that. For the next three days, the small boat was tossed by the choppy sea, drenched, exhausted, their legs numb. Eventually, they landed in Malta. Some were so weak, they had to be carried off the boat. Mohammed was taken to a camp. I did a year in the migrants' camp. We could only go out for two and a half hours. So spending a year like that is complicated. All you do is you eat, you sleep, you are not learning anything. There's no one teaching you. With no prospects of a future on the island, Mohammed paid smugglers to take him to Italy. When I first arrived in Rome, I was 17. I didn't know anyone. So I went to the train station and slept outside there with other homeless people. 
I had my cardboard that I slept on and all my belongings in a big plastic bag. It was a lonely time. It's difficult, but there's a lot of solidarity and generosity among people who live on the streets. This was Mohammed's life for three months until he learned about a center for unaccompanied minors called Chivico Zero, sponsored by Save the Children. He started to learn Italian, trained to work at a hotel, and discovered a passion that would change his life forever. One of the workers gave me a disposable camera and suggested I take photos of everything around me. My first photo was of the bag of all my belongings on the street where I live near the train station. I took it so I wouldn't forget what I had been through. It was a way of conserving the past. I think that when one is better off, you risk forgetting what your life was once like. With an image you remember. Mohammed never expected or dreamed of becoming a photographer. At first, he just took pictures for himself. The center, Chivico Zero, put his work on display. Other photographers took notice, and through word of mouth, his career took off. Some of his photos have been part of exhibits around Italy. I did not have the opportunity to tell my journey through images. I now have a chance to tell a little bit of what I went through. While in Italy, Mohammed got word from his extended family in Ivory Coast. His brother had returned for a visit. The two were finally able to reconnect. A few years later, Mohammed went to Mali to visit his brother. While there, he also decided to create a photo documentary of his journey. That's where he came up with the idea of workshops for at-risk youth. I chose these young people because their families have trouble making ends meet. If you don't intervene, they don't finish their studies. If they don't have a stable job, they will do everything that's no good. Mohammed's first workshop was in 2017. He's held several more since. While he teaches his students about photography, the aim of his class goes beyond taking photos. It's important not just to give them a camera and find someone to teach them photography, but the laboratory is like everyone's family. A family that makes sure they go to school, that cares about their health and worries about the other problems that happen in the family. In my opinion, children need a guarantee. The guarantee of giving them something that can be useful to them tomorrow. You can give them money today and then it runs out within a year or two. That's not a guarantee. The guarantee is teaching them something they will be able to do for the rest of their life to feed their families, help people around them. That's a guarantee. Education matters because education is the only equalizer in life. The push now for Emily and UNHCR is to have host countries include refugees in their national education systems, instead of running parallel separate systems with unqualified, though dedicated teachers and an improvised curriculum. For example, a country like Djibouti has translated the entire French education curriculum to English just to make it more accessible to the refugees. And Rwanda, 90% of refugees are integrated in the public education system. So the refugees and the nationals are learning side by side. There are, of course, challenges. Language, as Emily mentioned earlier, but also cost. In the East Horn and Great Lakes region, most of the countries are struggling to ensure that all their citizens go to school. Therefore, including refugees in the national education systems, they need support. They need to be supported by the international community in terms of ensuring that they are provided with adequate resources that will not only facilitate refugees to enroll in schools, but also their host population. Emily has seen the results of what happens when refugees are included. She recalls the story of a refugee who, like Mary, also lived in Kakuma. She was able to go to university in Kenya to study nursing. She graduated just before the pandemic and got an internship at Kenya's biggest hospital. And just by the fact that her skills were used by the government of Kenya to give back 
not just to the refugee community but to the public makes a very big impact for us and speaks to the refugees that the investment that is made by the countries of asylum into a refugee is not just for the refugees, it's not just for their families or communities, but it is for the bigger public. In our next episode, we take a step back and look at some of the biggest emergencies in the world over the last seven decades. And I just remember thinking in my head, how can they all be wounded? Well, there's like, they said there's thousands of people and they're all wounded. I was like, and I just remember thinking, how can they all be wounded? What are we gonna do when we get there? Forced to Flee is produced, written, and mixed by Wakas Chuktai. I'm the editor, Shirley Kamia. Additional production support and voiceovers in this episode by Kobena Edjabo and freelance journalist Marie Armel Lafori. Special thanks to UNHCR's bureaus in Africa and Europe, the Goodwill Ambassador team in London, and the team in Italy. The opening and closing music was composed by Max Richter. To hear the story behind this song and what inspired Max, visit unhcr.org forward slash Forced to Flee podcast. Visual design, marketing, and social media by Red Havas. Our executive producer is Barney Thompson. And our host is UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador Anita Rani. To learn more about the UN Refugee Agency, visit unhcr.org.